right, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 8 this morning. John chapter 8, as we look at verses 12 through 59 in a message I've entitled Illumination. John chapter 8, 12 through 59 in Illumination. This past Sunday, we observed a, a national ho- a holiday to honor the legacy and the impact of Martin Luther King Jr. There were many people who contributed to the modern civil rights movement, uh, those from the North, uh, there were some in the South. We had people of all different shades that helped to advance uh, the, and recognize the rights of those of color. And so in some ways, that national holiday that we celebrated on Monday, uh, in fact, uh, points to all of the different people who helped in that cause. And yet, Martin Luther King Jr. stands apart and above all others, his nonviolent protests stood against many of the violent protests of the day. And let me just say in parentheses, against many of the violent protests of our day. His vision for what America could be was compelling. It was a compelling portrait of the possible. But it was his ability to harness the power of the scriptures that gave a special weight to his speeches. In an address entitled, The Other America, Uh, which was given to an assembly in Michigan in March of 1968. Reverend King actually cited a portion of today's text. An excerpt from that address reads like this. He said, I still believe that freedom is the bonus you receive for telling the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And I do not see how we will ever solve the turbulent problem of race confronting our nation until there is an honest confrontation with it and a willing search for the truth and a willingness to admit the truth when we discover it. And more than anything, more than his method of protest, more than his compelling vision of what could be, Reverend King used the gravity of scriptural truth as the argumentation for his cause. It wasn't merely about the rhetorical flourish, but it was the very weight of heaven mustered to the fight of human dignity. But before King echoed those words, and before King James translated those words, it was Jesus who spoke those words. And Jesus' call to freedom isn't merely a call for a temporal right of civil rights. His call to freedom is the cosmological struggle between good and evil, between Satan and God, between heaven and hell. Read with me as Jesus makes... Another one of his seven I am statements here in verse 12. He says this, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. In Jewish literature, living in the light is a metaphor for living in a relationship with God. The lighting of the lamps figure prominently in Hanukkah. They figured prominently in the Festival of the Tabernacles. But Jesus takes illumination a step further. He is not simply referring to himself as the light of the world in relation to the Festival of the Tabernacles. He is referring to himself and proclaiming himself to be the light of the world in relation to the mission of God in the world. John 1.5 reminds us, The light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not grasp or comprehend it. Augustine said that a burning lamp is indeed capable at the same time of exposing to view other things that the darkness covered and of showing itself to your eyes. When Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he is saying, not only do I expose things hidden in the dark, but I reveal myself to you. And if you follow me, you will have the light that brings life. There is no flinching in Jesus. Jesus doesn't say, I am the light of the world with a question mark after it. There is no equivocation. There is no doubt. There is no hesitation. He is clear. He is bold. He declares his authority. And by making that declaration that he is light, he is implying that everybody who is not with him is walking in darkness. When Jesus says to the woman at the beginning of the chapter, neither do I condemn you, he has established himself as a judicial authority. He is not merely a plaintiff making a claim. He is a judge presiding over all. 
And sensing this claim of authority and legal challenge from Jesus, the Pharisees tried to invoke the fine print of Deuteronomy chapter 17 here in verse 13. And they say, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not valid. But Jesus responds that his testimony is true. They're worried about its validity. He's concerned with its truthfulness. And in verse 14, he says, Even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true because I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you don't know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge by human standards. I judge no one. And if I do judge, my judgment is true because it is not I alone who judge but I and the Father who sent me. Even in your law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am the one who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. Now when Jesus says, your law, in verse 17, he's not denigrating the law. As the law of God, it really is Jesus' law. And Jesus is not disowning the law here. He is chastising them for their wrong understanding of the law. He says, you judge according to human standards, but I know judge no one. But if I do judge, I don't judge people by human standards, but by a heavenly perspective. Not a limited, finite understanding, but an eternal perspective. Now, let's step back from a moment. A lot of times we, we wonder why God allows certain things into our life. We, we wonder why we're faced with certain persecution or opposition or difficulties or struggles. And we, we know that we can trace much of that back to Genesis chapter 3 in the fall, right? But what we often forget is that God is standing outside of time. From a heavenly perspective, He sees all. And what we might think of as this major thing in our life that's actually just this little roadblock that's going to bring us closer to Him and closer to holiness. He's standing back. We're here in our own finite perspective. God sees over all. And if Jesus were operating on His own as you and I do, the Pharisees might have a point about His need for multiple witnesses. But Jesus Himself affirms multiple witnesses in Matthew chapter 18. So the issue is not multiple witnesses, but Jesus roots the legality of his testimony in his triune nature. In verse 14, he says, I know where I came from and where I'm going. And in verse 18, he tells them, the father who sent me testifies about me. One commentator says the activity of the son is defined by his relationship with the father. And the activity of the Father is made known by his relationship to the Son. Jesus is not alone in his own testimony. The Father points to the Son. The Spirit points to the Son. There are, in fact, multiple witnesses here. But in verse 19, the Pharisees want to know where this second witness is. And so they ask the question, where is your Father? And Jesus responds by saying, you don't know me or my Father to know one of us, is to know the other. And despite the fact that he was being as bold as he was, they could not shut him up or take him into custody. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. But Jesus isn't done with them yet. Not only was he explicit about being the light, he was prophetic about his eventual ascension. Look with me here in verse 21. Then he said to them again, I'm going away. You will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. You will die in your sin. Now this can be taken to mean because of your sin or in a state of sin. But in the context of this verse where Jesus is quote-unquote going away, it most especially means you will die because of your sin of rejecting me. Jesus said, I am going away. He didn't say, you are going to take me away. Never let anyone fool you into thinking that Jesus was a helpless victim. When, he, when they wanted to lay hands on him, they could not because his hour had not yet come. He is pretty clear that he was the one choosing the terms of his sacrifice. He wasn't having them imposed on him. In the verse 22, the Jews said this in response, He won't kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. That's a rhetorical question. He won't kill himself, will he? This isn't a real question. It's a question that 
Christians meant uh, to question Jesus' sanity. Suicide in this culture, like in most cultures, was considered egregious and terrible. But here's the irony. Jesus did, in fact, do what they suggested. He willingly placed himself on the cross. They never assumed there was a place that Jesus would or could go that they too could not follow him. But that's because they, were, they assumed that they were the same as him. But Jesus reminds them that they are in fact very different. Read with me in verse 23. You are from below, he told them. I am from above. You're of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore I told you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he... You will die in your sins. Who are you? They question. Exactly what I've been telling you from the very beginning, Jesus told them. I have many things to say and to judge about you, but the one who sent me is true. And what I have heard from him, these things I tell the world. They did not know what he was speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own. But just as the Father taught me, I say these things. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, because I always do what pleases him. When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. Now Jesus is pointing back to the words of Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 14. But this phrase is loaded with a double meaning. It speaks to Jesus being lifted up in praise and glory for all to profess. But it also has a literal meaning. It speaks of Jesus being literally lifted up on the cross, His body hung for all to see. The defeat of sin comes first, and the exaltation of the Savior comes after. He became sin who knew no sins that we might become the righteousness of God. He says, I am the light of the world. I am the Son of Man. I am standing in front of you, The same as I was when I was standing there at the moment of creation. If you do not believe in me, you will die in your sins. And guess what? In verse 30, some did believe. Many did believe in him. They heard the things that he was saying. They listened to his testimony. They didn't need to see the second witness of the Father. They believed in him. And Jesus gave them a way to know for sure that their belief was authentic. Look with me in verse 31. Then Jesus said to the Jews, if you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You want to know if your faith is authentic? You will continue in God's word. You will obey it. You will hunger for it. You will thirst for it. But remaining and continuing in God's word isn't just about your Bible reading plan. It's also about your obedience. To remain in God's word is to hold on to his teaching, to believe it, to do it. Those who are true disciples believe God's word, consume God's word, and obey God's word. Believe the word of God is truth. To know the word is to know truth, and the truth and knowing the truth will set you free. But the notion of freedom prompts a question from those who are there. In verse 33, they say this, We are descendants of Abraham, they answered him, and we have never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say you will become free? Clearly, this is a ridiculous question. Has their memory been erased that they forgot that whole period of slavery in Egypt? Have they forgotten their captivity in Babylonian exile? Have they forgotten the fact that at the present they live under Roman occupation? Clearly a ridiculous statement, but they make that statement that they have never been enslaved. And Jesus responds in verse 34. Truly, I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in the household forever, but a son does remain forever. So if the son sets you free, you really will be free. Jesus responds to their statement about slavery by reminding them that slavery is more about their sin than their seed. Let me say that again. Slavery is more about their sin than their seed. Their slavery is a function of their unbelief 
rather than their heritage. Who the sun sets free is truly free. Their slavery wasn't to the Egyptians, the Babylonians, or to the Romans. Their slavery was to sin. And Jesus is offering to transfer them from their status as slaves of sin to sons of God, from their bondage to their freedom, from the property of Satan to adoption by God. And he elaborates on this notion of their family tree here in verse 37. He says, I know you're a descendant of Abraham, but you are trying to kill me because my word has no place among you. I speak what I have seen in the presence of the Father. So then you do what you have heard from your father. Our father is Abraham, they replied. If you were Abraham's children, Jesus told them, you would do what Abraham did. But now you are trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You are doing what your father does. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, then you would do what Abraham did. And Hebrews 11 and Romans 4 remind us that Abraham had faith. He believed. But instead of having faith like Abraham did, you people are trying to kill me. And because you are trying to kill me right now, it's clear that your father isn't Abraham. It's clear that your father is someone entirely different. Perhaps there were some who knew of the circumstances surrounding Jesus' birth. In the back half of verse 41, they make this statement, We weren't born of sexual immorality. We have one Father, God. So it's possible that they were taking a dig at him based upon the circumstances of his conception. But this is also a protest here. They're assuring themselves that their place is secure by their relationship to Abraham. We are God's chosen people. Jesus sees things differently, and he lets them know that their father isn't God, but someone quite the opposite. In verse, in verse 42, he says to them, If God were your father, you would love me, because I came from God and I'm here. For I didn't come on my own, but he sent me. Why don't you understand what I say? Because you cannot listen to my word. You are, your father, you are of your father the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. Desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Who among you can convict me of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? The one who is from God listens to God's words. This is why you don't listen, because you are not from God. Jesus lays down some clarifying remarks here, some clarifying doctrinal remarks on Satan, truth, and his perfection. He makes it clear that Satan is a murderer and has always been a murderer. He makes it clear that Satan has no truth in him. He speaks lies because that is his very nature. Jesus says he's a liar and the father of lies. In contrast to Satan who is the father of lies, Jesus declares his words to be truth. Unlike Satan, who among you can convict me of sin? Which is a rhetorical question with the obvious answer being no one. No one of you can convict me of sin. Why? Because I'm sinless, Jesus says. At the beginning of the chapter, when Jesus declares that the one without sin should cast the first stone, only Jesus is left with the woman. Why? Because he's the only one without sin. And unlike many in our culture, Jesus doesn't declare the truth to be a dead notion. He doesn't say your truth, my truth, their truth. He says the truth. He speaks of the truth. God's very antidote for sin is standing right in front of them. God's get out of jail free card is speaking with them. But rather than embrace his words, they reject his words. Rather than seeing Jesus as God's accommodation, they rebuke him. Of course, the declaration that they are Satan's children doesn't sit well. Verse 48, they respond by saying, Aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? Now once again, they're they're seeking to degrade Jesus by using an ad hominem attack. Ad hominem meaning against the man. An attack which doesn't engage with Jesus' argument but seeks to undermine his credibility. They're attacking his heritage. They're attacking his mental state. They claim that he is both a Samaritan and demon-possessed, but this is no mere insult. To call him a Samaritan and to call him demon-possessed is simply to call him a heretic. 
to say that he has exceeded the boundaries of orthodoxy. He's, they're accusing him of straying from the one true God. But Jesus sets this straight in verse 49. He says, I do not have a demon. On the contrary, I honor my Father and you dishonor me. I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and judges. Truly, I tell you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. If anyone keeps my word, for someone to keep my word, they must believe it first. But clearly, these people didn't believe. And again, they come back to this discussion of Jesus' sanity in verse 52. They said, now we know you have a demon. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. You say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died? And the prophets who died? Who do you claim to be? Well, their argument goes something like this. Abraham died. The prophets died. So when you make that statement about someone not tasting death, you're basically saying that you're greater than Abraham and the prophets. So who is it that you claim to be again? Now Jesus makes it crystal clear in verse 54. If I glorify myself, Jesus answered, my glory is nothing. My Father, about whom you say He is our God, He is the one who glorifies me. You don't know Him, but I know Him. If I were to say I don't know Him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know Him, and I keep His word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. And they replied to him, You aren't fifty years old yet, and you've seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. Am. And so they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus was hidden and went out of the temple. If there is any doubt as to who Jesus thought himself to be, he just settled the matter. He is the great I am. He is the voice of the burning bush. He is Yahweh himself. Not a created being, not just a teacher, not just a prophet, God himself. He was unequivocal. And they knew exactly what he was claiming to be because they picked up the stones to throw at him. But again, Jesus was hidden because his hour had not yet come. Jesus is God. He is light, he is truth, and he is freedom. That's our main idea this morning. Jesus is God. He is light, truth, and freedom. The Gospel of John features something of a progression here in the attitudes towards Jesus. He's gone from private meetings with Nicodemus to public interactions with the Pharisees. Do you all kind of see that progression? Their challenges over honor have now transitioned into being challenges over the legal code. There's a movement here. From private to public, from inquiries to interrogation, with each declaration of Jesus, there is growing hostility. Jesus is simultaneously the judge of the world and its Savior. He brings light to darkness. He brings dead to life. He makes the enslaved free. He makes orphans, sons, and daughters. He is light, he is truth, and he is freedom. So by way of application, let me give you three things to apply here. Number one, walk in the light. Walk in the light. How do you walk in the light? First of all, you believe. You believe. John wrote the gospel so that you might believe. The people of God are those who believe in the Son of God. People of God are those who belong to the bloodline of Christ. The light of the Word makes things clear and it exposes our sin and our need for a Savior. The slavery of sin is emancipated by His grace. Sin and death dissipate in the presence of Christ like light, like darkness when it's confronted by light. It's only when I admit to being what I am not supposed to be that I can be declared who I do not deserve to be. We got a telescope over Christmas. We set it up in the kids' room, and we looked at the moon with our naked eye, and then we looked at the moon through the telescope. And it's amazing how much more detail is brought out when you look at it under the lens of a telescope. It's, a, it's way more fascinating to look at through that, that way. But as fascinating as the moon is, you remember that it's not generating its own light. It's merely reflecting the light of the sun, kind of like you and me. As our Christian witnesses, we aren't generating our own light. We're reflecting the light of the sun. The sun is light. 
C.S. Lewis says, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun is risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. Believe, walk in the light. Number two, walk in truth. Walk in truth. When we were living in Fort Worth, Augustus started his kindergarten year, and we got him started in a school that was right over next to the campus of Texas Christian University, and it was supposedly this wonderful school. Picked him up from school one day, and he said, Dad, we celebrated Hanukkah today. I said, you did what? He said, we celebrated Hanukkah. I said, tell me about that. So he gave me a little bit of what that happened in the course of the class, and so I approached his teacher, who was a uh, Mormon. I said, uh, what, why are we celebrating Hanukkah in class? And his response was, well, if we want to have a Christmas tree up in class, we've got to expose them to all the world's religions. I said, you know, you understand that religions aren't abstract. That religions make truth claims. So you may expose them to the ceremonies of Kwanzaa, the ceremonies of Hanukkah, You may expose them to all of these different ceremonies, but in some subtle way, what you're sending the message to them is that religion is just about these ceremonies that we do from time to time. When in fact, religion is a truth claim to believe something. Christianity makes a number of truth claims. Jesus himself makes a number of truth claims, very explicit. He says, I am here. To say that something is true is to correspondingly say that everything else is false. For something to be true means that other things have to be false. We can't all hold these things in equal tension. Tim Keller says, among secular adults, young secular adults, it is common to adopt this belief that all religions are roughly the same. Dare I say that this is a form of emotional immaturity. Life is filled with hard choices, and it is childish to think you can avoid them. It may seem to get you out in front of a lot of hard work, but the idea of the equivalence of religions is simply a falsehood. Every religion, even those that appear to be inclusive, makes its own unique claims. But Jesus' claims are particularly unnerving because if they are true, there is no alternative but to bow the knee to him. Jesus says, I am. I am living water. I am the son of God. I am God himself. And for the Christian, the only appropriate response is to say, I am his. Walk in the light. Walk in truth. And finally, walk in freedom. Walk in freedom. Christian freedom is a little bit different than American freedom. There are some commonalities, but they are not the same. The phrase, don't tread on me, captures the American spirit. It's liberation from something. When a Christian thinks of freedom, they should see it as liberation for something. The freedom Jesus speaks of is uniquely Christian. It's a freedom found in Him. It's not about a freedom from slavery and servitude, because as Christians, we are in fact slaves, bondservants of Jesus Christ. No, freedom isn't about being released from slavery. Freedom is about trading in a terrible master in Satan for a gracious master in Christ. It's freedom for something more than from something. For freedom. Christ set us free. So rather than submit to the yoke of your old master, submit to the yoke of your new master because his yoke is easy. In Jesus, you can have freedom over sin. In Jesus, you can have freedom from your past. In Jesus, you can have freedom to a new life. In Jesus, you can know freedom in its purest sense. Walk in the light, walk in the truth, and walk in freedom, walk in Jesus. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. ended his speech that evening in 1968 using the words, Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we're free at last. It's a mixture of a Negro spiritual in the words of this text, and it had great and powerful effect. And the world is in many ways a better place 
for having had Martin Luther King Jr. counted in its history. But you don't have to do much research to realize that King was a flawed man. He fell very short academically. He plagiarized much of his dissertation. He fell maritally, having relationships with women who were not his wife. He fell theologically, trading in the orthodoxy of the virgin birth for the heterodoxy of liberation theology. Despite the very powerful way in which he used the scriptures towards a just cause, he was a flawed man. Just like Adam, Abraham, Moses, David, Peter, and the Apostle Paul. Just like me, and just like you. And the point of this is not to denigrate the man in any way. The point of this is to show Christ for who he is. Because all of the great men who have ever lived are just shadows of the perfection that is in Jesus Christ. All of the great women who have ever lived in faith are but fleeting tributes to the Alpha and the Omega in Christ. Our answer is to not put our hope in great men, to put our trust in a great Savior. And toward that end, let me reconstruct a portion of King's speech to esteem that great Savior. We shall overcome because the arc of, moral, because the, arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards Jesus. We shall overcome because Christ reigns forever. We shall overcome because the Redeemer pressed into the earth did not stay in the ground. We shall overcome because the truth of God and the Lamb of God is seated on the throne of God. We shall overcome because the Bible is right and our faith is well placed. And with this faith, we shall be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discourse of our world into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to speed up the day when all of God's creation will hear the gospel of Jesus and with every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And when you say Jesus is Lord, you are free. You are free indeed. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. 